10 practices down for TCU football this spring with five to go. We're going to give you guys an update on what's going on out on the football field. Plus, men's basketball and women's basketball are both full on in their off-season swing. Uh, a couple of visitors come to town for hoops this week with a commitment already on the books for Jamie Dixon's squad. Plus, CC Baseball finally gets a weekend win. And what do they do with it on a Tuesday night? Well, it's happening right now, and it's not great. All that and more coming up on this episode of Frogs Insider. Welcome in to another episode of Frogs Insider. Jamie Plunkett here alongside a hungry and busy Melissa Trebowasser this evening as the Sacramento Kings are getting ready to play their play-in game. Melissa, uh, I know we've got a lot to talk about, but this is uh, this is kind of a fun night for you over there in Sacktown. This is so cool. Um, the Kings are playing the Warriors, which is like both incredibly awesome and like 100% terrifying for me. Um, but I, I am here. I'm in the media workroom. I just walked past Dan Van Gundy and almost passed out. I was so excited. Um, I couldn't even like say hi to him, even though I wanted to. Um, yeah, this is it's a suit. This is like definitely like a dream scenario. Um, the only negative is that I am recording a video podcast and they gave us French dip sandwiches tonight, which are delicious, but means you're going to see a lot of me awkwardly eating halfway on and a halfway off screen. So this means that you definitely want to check out the YouTube version of this podcast. If you're listening right now on Spotify or Apple podcasts or wherever you get your pods, make sure you hop over to the YouTube channel over at frogs insider and um, just, just watch Melissa eat this French dip and, and see at what points in time is Jamie vamping so that Melissa can actually yeah. eat a meal before so she, can, she covers yeah. the basketball game this yeah, evening. It's Melissa, been a, been a day, man. Uh, it's been a crazy day. We, we, we are recording this on Tuesday, April 16th. I hope you paid your taxes, everybody, because uh, yesterday was the deadline. And if you didn't do it, you're a delinquent. But uh, you know who's not delinquent, Melissa, uh, is our wonderful podcast network uh, organizer, Dave Campbell's Texas Football and the Republic of Texas uh, football network. I'm very thankful to be a part of that group. 13 podcasts, each about uh, one D1 uh, football program in the state of Texas. You can find that wherever you get your podcast. Just search Republic of Football uh, and it will show up right there. You'll get our show. You'll get uh, the Gambling Gauchos. You'll get Between Two Bears. You'll get uh, just Every every school in the state of Texas has has a pod on the network and it's pretty fun. Um, everybody's great. Everybody's we great. We love we love all of our all we, of our friends across the network. We do love all of our friends across the network. We also love our very fun podcast sponsor, Hell's Half Acre Stadium Goods. Very thankful for them as well. We'll talk about them a little bit later on in the show as well, but always love talking about Hell's Half Acre up at the top of the show as well. I'm wearing a Hell's Half Acre hat tonight. The rope hat, the the baseball uh Sunday logo and rope hat. An outstanding, and, uh, outstanding, a fantastic hat guys. feels great, uh, even when TC baseball doesn't. Um, but before we get into baseball, Melissa, TCU football is two thirds of the way through spring practice, and there have been some interesting trends over the first 10 practices that we've started to see. And I wanted to maybe touch on a couple of those tonight for folks who haven't been able to get out to one of the open practices or haven't been on the board over at hornfrogblitz.com reading Jeremy's wonderful practice updates. I mean, the guy cranks out 2000 words about a spring practice. Uh, like I, I watch a spring practice and I don't think I even think 2000 words. And so for him to, to be pumping out that kind of content on a, on a weekly basis is pretty impressive. So I would encourage everybody to go and subscribe and, and read his updates. But um, there's some really fun things that I think are, are, uh, reasons for hope, I guess this, this part of the spring, we talked on the last episode, Melissa about, you know, let's maybe not read too much into the ins and outs of what's happening, but find good reasons to get excited and be hopeful for the fall. And, uh, one of the reasons that I am getting pretty hopeful for fall football is the way Andy Avalos has begun to install on the defensive side of the ball. They've done a lot uh, of really interesting things, especially with their front seven. I think this is going to be a pretty strong front seven for, for TCU, but also with the secondary. It's a fully revamped secondary. They brought in a lot of guys in the portal, and he's putting them out there. He's he's running them out there, and he's saying, go go make plays. They've run a lot of 4-2-5. They've run a little bit of 4-3 uh, and some some four one six dime 
as well, which I was really uh, impressed to see um, out there the other day. So that was that was pretty cool. But um, Melissa, I know that you're obviously not in Fort Worth, but when you talk to folks and and when you're when you're thinking about football, like what's getting you kind of fired up uh, about the frogs this spring? I mean, I think my favorite thing that I've seen so far is what Andy Avalos has brought is the ability to put square pegs in, in square holes, right? Mm -hmm. um, he seems like he's really setting guys up for success as far as turning them loose to do the things they do well, which yeah. is a lot of pressure the quarterback, swarming the football, forcing turnovers, getting the guys' faces, playing physical and playing fast. Um, you know, I think we've, we've heard a lot more about pressure than, than we had the last couple of years. And this is going to be an attacking, aggressive, and like you mentioned, kind of flexible defense as far as the different lineups they can utilize. Um, and so I, I know you, you put his name on the run sheet, but I have seen the name Marcel Brooks everywhere so far this spring. And I, I don't think there's a TC fan in existence that doesn't want to see this kid healthy and like living up to the potential that we've all know that he does have. Um, and it just hasn't really gotten to show. And this defense seems tailor made for guys like him, guys like Chad Banks, guys like Mamdi, Obiezar. Um, it, it just seems like there are a lot, you know, the defensive line. There's a lot of guys that are going to benefit from the style Avalos wants to play. It's just going to be a matter of when the pads come on for real, does that translate to the regular season? Um, but all sides point to at least being encouraged that this will be the type of defense we're used to seeing in Fort Worth as opposed to what we saw the last couple of years. Absolutely. Getting getting some good pressure. And it's not it hasn't been just Marcel Brooks, but really all of the defensive linemen and some linebackers as well. Uh, as Avalos continues to kind of dial up different pressures. It's one of those things where, and we talk about this every spring, okay, does that mean that the defense is, is really good? Or does that mean we should be worried about the offensive line? Like, which way do we kind of push and pull on this equation? Uh, and I think that the takeaway, kind of like you said, is regardless of what the on-field results are in the fall, as far as wins and losses are concerned, the reality is, is that this defense is going to try and dial up a, a lot more pressure than a season ago. And I think that's kind of the key takeaway, whether it's Brooks, who I think people are getting close to buying in on the spring Marcel Brooks hype train once more. Uh, I, I think this is probably his best opportunity. It's also his last opportunity to be a contributor on, on the football field this fall. But also um, Marcus Steele's brother, who transferred in from Tulane, uh, Devin Deal, um, is another guy who they've been running out at that uh, stud spot who's had a really good spring as well. And, uh, you know, if you look along TCU's offensive line, I'm tempted to say the tackles are probably some of the best linemen going right now. And those are the guys that that stud position is typically lining up against and they're having a lot of success. So whether it's bless Harris or Mike Nichols or one of the other tackles that's, that's being rolled out there, the stud spot at that end on the defensive line is having, having a really good spring so far. And I think that's something that can give frog fans some really good hope. Well, I think, you know, and, and we've certainly seen this in the past, but one thing we know is that a defense that's creating pressure generally will be able to create pressure, even against a really good offensive line when you're bringing that pressure from different areas. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one thing that, that we seem to be getting is that Avalos isn't afraid to try other things to bring guys from different locations, um, you know, to bring guys down from the secondary. So I, I do think that as athletic as this defense is, if they can do some pinning their ear back, ears back and just going and getting the quarterback, they can be successful. And it seems like there's a lot of opportunity to do that. That being said, like you mentioned, a lot of the names I keep seeing on offense are guys that, no offense, I love our walk-ons. I appreciate the work they're putting in. But if they're just rolling out in uniform in August and September, we're probably having different conversations about TCU ceiling. Um, and so, you know, there's opportunity for some of that. You mentioned the secondary. Cam Smith is a, is a great poll for that as far as a guy who's really stepped in and made an impact. Um, but – we haven't seen TC's ones out there at the skill positions, you know, quarterback at wide receiver very often. Um, and we still have some determination as to what those ones might look like on offense. Mm -hmm. um, while we're talking about that, I do want to talk about the running back situation with the offensive line being a big question mark. The things we're hearing about the running game, I, I think is overall definitely a positive and I'm excited. I'm still concerned. I'd still like one more guy, but I'm really excited about uh, what, what Cook has done so far. And it looks like he has a chance to be something really special. 
He he does, and I, I liked Cook when they signed this kid. Uh, I I thought he looked great last year in workouts. Um, and yeah, I mean, on Monday, the tenth practice of the year, he he you know he snapped off an eighty yard touchdown run. Uh, it was a great run. He made a couple guys miss. He hit the hole really hard, and he's gotten progressively better, and I think progressively more confident over the course of this spring. I don't know that. I don't know that he's necessarily earned the number one spot yet, but it feels like the momentum is trending in that direction at this point. Obviously, you still have Trey Sanders, who as I, I continue to believe the further he gets away from that horrific car accident the better he will be on the football field. Um, and so I think you're you're starting to see a, a somewhat viable one-two punch maybe start to develop in TCU's running game. Not to mention, I know we don't have Hoover out there right now, but you see Ken Seals running the ball a little bit like he showed at his time at Vanderbilt. And we know from, from his high school days, Haas Haney's running ability, and he's flashed that quite a few times already this spring. It feels like the running game part of the offense is in really good shape right now against a defensive front seven that has been aggressive, has gotten into the backfield a lot, um, but the running game has has still managed to get theirs, and I think that's something to to hang their hat on at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think we've we've fallen for the uh, the Nick said there in the background, <laughs> Nick. Um, <laughs> Uh, we followed a little bit in love with with the backup quarterbacks and the spring practice quarterbacks over the last couple of years and gotten burned by it, right? Sure. So that's always a concern. But I do think what we're seeing is that, you know, hopefully Josh Hoover's injury doesn't stretch into the regular season. Hopefully mm -hmm. you're not looking at needing a backup, but TCU has needed a backup and a third quarterback very often over the course of the last five years. And they're definitely encouraging signs with both Ken Seals and Hoss Haney um, that if they need to come in for a series, if they need to play a game, they're, that, that everything's not going to just roll over and die immediately. I mean, these are guys that have some athleticism, that have some skills, that have the ability to, to move the ball with some accuracy and seem really, really comfortable in the offensive system and what Bryles is asking them to do. And so I'm not ready to anoint Haas Haney as a true freshman early mm -hmm. enrollee as sure. the future, but – but I will say, I at least like that we're seeing some progression. We're seeing, um, you know, I, I think Jeremy mentioned this, that, that he's not afraid just to, to let the ball go deep. And yes. you've got to have a guy, you've got to have a quarterback that's willing to take the top off. And Ken Seals, I think, is just really steady. Um, you know, I don't know mm -hmm. if he's a guy that can put a team on his back and, and will you to a win, but he's definitely a guy that can move the football and, and with a good defense behind them could certainly navigate TC to a couple of conference wins if, if asked to do it based on what we're seeing today which means absolutely nothing but at least at least we have a little bit more hope in that quarterback room that we've had in the last couple sure of years. i think i think there's reason for that hope for sure and um like you said you don't know what hoover's going to be when he gets back this summer either and uh it, it's a question but it feels like it is uh, like there is legitimate reason to to be hopeful there um you gotta you gotta show it though when it counts and and Really, Hoover's the dude in that in that regard. Seals a little bit, but Josh Hoover, I think, has shown the most ability as far as ceiling goes at the collegiate level uh, between himself and Seals at this point. So you really do hope that he bounces back and, and gets where he needs to get by August uh, when fall camp rolls around. Uh, and you mentioned the receivers, too. There are a couple guys that have been banged up uh, that have not played a ton of spring ball. JoJo Earl is one of those guys. Uh, there are a couple others as well that have have sat out with with some bumps and bruises. JPR sat out for a couple practices. Jack Besh though has looked phenomenal. He's finally healthy. He battled injuries all fall, uh, and if he is a healthy contributor, you pair him with Savion Williams, with John Paul Richardson, with Drake Dabney, the Baylor tight end transfer, um, and that starts to look like a, a, a plus. Eric McAllister, obviously the Boise State transfer, who's had a great spring as well. Um, you're starting to talk about a, a very good wide receiver tight end room that uh, is going to give whoever ends up playing quarterback plenty of opportunities to get them the football uh, and make plays happen. So uh, excited to see uh, those guys doing that. And then lastly, kind of as we wrap up football here along the offensive line, you know, we talked earlier about um, 
some of the some of the issues that we've seen from the offensive line this spring and the the chaos that the defensive line has been able to cause. Some guys are still having really good spring balls on on the offensive line. You know, Bless Harris has established himself, I think, as the the, the number one left tackle at this point. The Florida State transfer Colton Deary looks much more comfortable at center this spring than he ever did at guard last season. Um, so I think we'll we can hope to see some improved play from him this. Uh, this fall as well. And you also have to remember one of their key transfer guys, Cade Bennett, uh, a left guard from San Diego state isn't on campus yet. He's not going to be here until this summer. He's already committed. He's already signed. He's, he's going to be a horn frog, but you're missing a guy who I think most coaches are penciling in as you're starting left or right guard, probably left guard uh, come fall. So Still some chemistry stuff, still some some you know lineups and and too deep to to get sorted out along the offensive line, but I think it's in a better spot, similar to the quarterback room than it was last year, simply because you've got more bodies uh, and theoretically you've got more capable bodies uh, in that in that room this year. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's it's spring ball. Yeah. But I would much rather have reasons to be excited and to have so many positives to harp on than be like, oh, my God, we're going to go 0-12. And, and so, again, mm-hmm. everybody's oh, no. Everybody's excited about their program. You know, to, to steal our friend Parker's line, everybody's worked harder than they ever have in the weight room. Everybody was <laughs> fresher than they've ever been, right? So, but, but I think because there's an injection of new blood, because there are some returning forces on the offensive end, um, because there are some new exciting transfers. There's nothing wrong with being hyped about what we see. And I think we can all agree on one thing, and that is Kyle Lemmerman, get out of high school and get to campus. Get here if there's now. one area that, My God. that has been just kind of a disaster, it has been the kicking game. And so I think we are all excited to anoint that 18-year-old prodigy as TCU's next great kicker mm. sooner rather than later. No joke. He needs to get here quickly. And I do want to shout out bef- before we fully move off of football, uh, 2025 quarterback commit Ty Hawkins. Um, he is absolutely showing out on the seven, seven on seven circuit this, this spring with Miami raw. He was just named the OT seven MVP uh, over in the Dallas seven on seven circuit last week. Um, the guy is Slinging, I had seven on seven, right? But this is a kid who I think legitimately, you talk about not knowing who the future quarterback is going to be for TCU. He's a guy who could certainly step on campus and throw his hat into the ring pretty quickly uh, to, to earn that number one quarterback spot. And so, you know, from a recruitment standpoint, it, it you talk about the room feeling better than it did a year ago. Feels like the momentum on the recruiting trail at quarterback is starting to gain some good momentum as well. He, he's playing so well that TCU fans are starting to fret that we're not going to be able to hold on to him. You've got to love, you've got to love being, you know, a, a mid-major power P4 team. That's like, oh no, he's good. Now we not. Now how are we going to hold on to him? People but are so people fun. are starting to know about him. This is the this is the yeah. old school Gary Patterson fear. We can't let yep. people know who we're recruiting or even, uh, in like let people know their names or see their faces or or they might end up stealing them away. But Ty you Hawkins know, seems you know pretty locked thing. in. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite thing about these two kids, Haas Haney and Ty Hawkins, is neither one of them has thrown a cleavage snap for, for TCU. But man, <laughs> yeah. you talk about guys that love this program. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you thought I was going to be, be funny here. No, I'm like, I'm going to be sincere here. Guys that love this program, that recruit this program, that have been on campus more times than we can count, um, that, that seem really committed and just really high character guys. And, and I think. You know, we were so spoiled with guys like Andy Dalton and Max Duggan and, you know, Trayvon Boykin for most of his time on campus uh, showed a lot of great leadership qualities. Um, it showed some not so great qualities as well. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, he gave us a moment with Abby at the Iowa State game that, uh, you know, absolves yeah. a lot of ill will. Um, but I think that, that those are the two types of kids that you want to build a program around and that both of those kids, when they're both on campus, hopefully, um, are going to relish the opportunity to compete with each other it's not I, I think that you'll you'll see them truly try to compete as opposed to one going yeah i'm, I'm gonna dip before i have a chance to earn the job um though, I, I'm a, mm-hmm. I don't know that we'll see all four of them or both of them for all four years at tc that's so unlikely in this era but i think that they'll both give it a fair shot to be the guy at tcu i definitely thought you were going to say something about 
something along the lines of the NFL mantra where it's like the favorite, everybody's favorite player on the team is the backup quarterback. Right. That too. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I agree with you and it'll be fun to see kind of what the future holds for, for TCU at that quarterback spot. Um, you don't have to wait until the future though, Melissa, to head over to hell's half acre SG.com and check out all of the TCU merch that they've got going on. Hell's half acre stadium goods is a brand that was created with horn frog fans in mind. And each item sold makes a direct impact on TCU student athletes. So if you go over to hell's half acre SG.com and you check out all their TCU gear from polos and shirts, headwear, like the hat I've got on home goods, they've got koozies, uh, everything you need to get ready for game day, whether that's a Saturday football game, a Tuesday midweek baseball game, or a big Monday basketball game, they've got you covered over there at Hell's Half Acre Stadium. Good. So get over there today and make sure that you drop a little note in there that you heard about them from Frogs Insider. Would love love our partnership with HHA and uh, and just love to love to keep that thing rolling, Melissa. 100% agree. I got a couple of shirts from them last week or a couple of weeks ago and could not be happier. They're Support our great. friends. Support our friends. Um, speaking of supporting, I don't have a segue for this, so I'm just going to jump into it. Men's I, basketball, I blew through your segue. Yeah. No, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, men's basketball got a commitment over the weekend from Arizona State transfer guard Frankie Collins. Uh, it's their second commitment of the off season joining grad transfer CJ Walker, a forward from UCF. Um, Collins is a good ad. This was one of the priorities for TCU in the portal. Jamie Dixon really wanted this kid. Um, he averaged a little over 13 points a game last season for an Arizona state team that took a step back from the year they appeared in the tournament and lost to TCU in the first round. That version of Frankie Collins in 2022-23 was an incredibly impressive one, in my my opinion. He averaged just under 10 points a game, but he also had a 2-to-1 assist-to-turnover ratio. He shot 45% from the floor and a little over 36% from three-point range in 22-23. When they expanded his role outside of hey, you're not just the point guard. You've got to be the guy a little bit more last year. I think he stepped up in a, in, from a scoring perspective, but some other aspects of his game and some of his efficiency declined a little bit in that role. So I'm interested to see how TCU uses him next season. Obviously, that's dependent on who else they bring in this offseason. But Frankie Collins, great ad. We've seen the ability to be very efficient and – uh, and and be able to score the basketball as well. With the way TCU likes to grow up their guards, I'm I'm interested in seeing how he takes a step forward under Jamie Dixon and his coaching staff. Yeah, I'm super hopeful that he'll be able to slide into that more natural playmaker distributor role at point guard. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what TCU was sorely lacking this past season. Um, I think that Avery Anderson, Tamir Nelson, um, all of those guys did a good job of trying to fill a role they weren't comfortable with. But I think the goal in bringing Frankie Collins, Sacramento native, by the way, Frankie Collins, there you um, go. back to TCU was um, is, is to bring him back to his more natural position as a true point guard um but like you said it's going to depend on a who else they can bring in and, and who steps up um you're going to mm-hmm. be relying on a lot of young guys and once again hopefully a handful of transfers that can really add some scoring punch that punch I, that's a little you know yeah you know. it's fun yeah um, punch. but yeah 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 um, but but some guys that can bring in some scoring because you don't want Frankie Collins to have to be that guy. Um, so I'm excited about the potential and the possibilities that, that exist with him coming to TCU. I just hope that, that TCU is able to recruit around him in a way that lets him play his more comfortable, natural role. Uh, fully agree with you there. They hosted Green Bay guard Noah Reynolds over the weekend for a visit as well. Um, so... You know, that's another guy that they are in the mix for. And they've got two more visits scheduled this week to kind of bigger bodies, a forward from St. Mary's who was known for their defense this year. And this guy particularly was a very big part of that defense forward, Joshua Jefferson. Uh, this would be a great get. He's 6'8", 220. Uh, plays bigger than that, though. Uh, averaged about 10 and 6 for the Gales last year. Uh, really good defensive guy. He's got a, multiple years to play as well, which is a big deal nowadays, especially when you're looking at the roster turnover that's happening at TCU this year. 
Um, so he's actually was in town on Tuesday for a visit. He's, he's a big target of theirs. And then Wyoming guard, Brendan Wenzel is going to be in town on Friday, but I say guard like that, Melissa, because the guy is six, seven, uh, he's a six, seven ball handler. He's, um, uh, not your traditional kind of Emmanuel Miller style forward that frog fans have been used to. He is about the same size as Emmanuel Miller, uh, but much more of a ball handler creator uh, rather than a post player three and D style guy like E-Man was. So two big guys on campus this week uh, that TCU is targeting and hopefully they get at least one or, or both in the fold here soon. You know, and I, I'm going to be at the Kings game and, you know, Peja Stojakovic will also be at the Kings game and Peja's son Andre just happens to be in the transfer portal from Stanford. So, you know, if we give him the opportunity, a pretty good shooter, some play in high school, some play at Stanford. Mm-hmm. It might be dropping some good little purple, purple power here. I mean, there are purple, purple. Mm-hmm. there are a few other guys that that the coaching staff is working on setting up some visits with. The son of a former NBA sharpshooter might just be one of them. You'll have to go head over to hornfrogblitz.com and maybe check out some of the stuff that we've been talking about over there. Uh, as those visits get scheduled, the Hornfrog Blitz community is is the first to know truly uh, because. You know, we only record a podcast once a week where we get to go back and talk about all that stuff. But if you want to know it on the day that it happens, get over to hornfrogblitz.com. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, I think this this season for TCU men's basketball specifically will be an interesting one. And like we said last week, it'll be fully dependent on how successful they are in the transfer portal. But the reality is, is this is also going to be an opportunity to flex their developmental abilities as coaches with Jace Posey and Isaiah Manning who redshirted this year and are sticking around uh, to see what they become in their first year where they're going to be stepping onto the court and playing basketball for TCU. Had a chance to talk with Emmanuel Miller about both of them last week in a longer interview that I did with E-Man. Um, That posted on the YouTube channel on Monday of this week. Uh, The podcast audio version is also up on all of our streams as well. Um, But I was really impressed by what Emmanuel had to say about Posey and Manning. He was, he's very enthusiastic about these two young guys and, and basically said that the program is in great hands because of them. Uh, And I thought that that was something that maybe can give frog fans a little bit of hope heading into this season. Yeah, I had a chance to talk to Isaiah a couple of times when he was in high school still and did a couple of interviews with him and it just came away so impressed by this kid. And um, they both have incredible maturity, um, mm-hmm. have great work ethics. Uh, th- this is important to them. Uh, we saw Jace Posey, you know, set the freshman record for the high jump um, at TCU as a member of the track and field team. Um, so there's certainly some some ability there for both of these guys. These are really good players, really highly thought of um, as as freshman recruits. I mean, the fact that they were willing to redshirt and, and work mm-hmm. on their game before hopefully becoming significant contributors in their second year on campus says a lot about them and, and what their long-term goals are. So I'm super excited to see what they do um, this season. And I hope we get to see a lot of Jace Posey and Isaiah Manning uh, contributing to this TC basketball program. You know, we've talked to a couple times on the pod about Jace Posey's athleticism. I know that when you've been in town for basketball practices and stopped by, you've gotten to see it firsthand. I've gotten to see it firsthand. Everybody at TCU got to see it firsthand. If you paid attention to TCU track and fields, social media last week, because Jace Posey debuted in the high jump and, you know, just happened to take first place with a 2.15 meter jump, which is a little over it's seven feet and a half inch. And uh, that was the fourth highest mark in TCU uh, track and field outdoor history and the 15th highest mark in the country this season. First yeah. time competing. Can, no big I've seen him dunk a basketball, so it didn't surprise me whatsoever that he could get off the ground. Pretty crazy. He's he uh, he explosive. He's a great athlete. Um, and then Isaiah Manning. Uh, Emmanuel Miller, if, if you go back and you listen to the podcast last week or last episode – he credited Manning with the season that he had. He said, this kid pushed me harder than anybody else. He held me accountable more than anybody else. He motivated me more than anybody else. Uh, and 
you know, I also had a chance to talk to E-Man. I, I kind of listed off some guys prior to him and then also him. And I said, you know, there's this group of guys that have come through TCU who always seem to A, be a leader on the team and B, mostly responsible for talking to the media after losses. And um, we talked, he and I talked a little bit about kind of that responsibility and, and how he, uh, you know, perceived it and experienced it. And he's, he ID'd Isaiah Manning as he's like, that's going to be the next guy to do that because he cares about this university. He's a natural leader and he's going to push people and hold them accountable. So uh, looking forward to not only seeing Isaiah Manning on the court next year, but seeing Isaiah Manning in post game quite frequently as well. Uh, the, the Garrett Wallow Memorial, we just lost a bad game here's your press conference tour. Right. It, it's like, it's always, yeah. it was always like Max Duggan, Garrett Wallow. It was Desmond Bain, Mike Miles. Oh, yeah. Right. Like just the guys that had to go suffer through it after a loss mm-hmm. um, and talk to us asking dumb questions that they had, they wanted no part of. Um, here, here it's uh, Harrison Barnes, <laughs> Keegan Murray, uh, Keon Ellis. Kid. Yeah. So it, it is funny how that like is something that's ubiquitous across all levels mm-hmm. of all sports. There's always yes. one guy that gets thrown to the wolves after a loss. Well, hopefully you get to talk to all three of those guys after a win tonight. Yeah. It, it, if it's, hey, if it's a win, it's going to be De'Aaron Foss and then Dobas after treatment, which means 75 minutes go. later. And then we never actually talk to him. But yeah. Oh, dope. We'll, hope, okay. we'll hope for one today. Yeah. Hope for one after a win today. It does not look like TCU baseball is going to come away with a win unless they get a late inning miracle here against Abilene Christian. They're currently down eight to three in the bottom of the seventh inning as we're recording this, which just wastes what was a very good weekend. One of the first good weekends they've had in a while here, uh, taking the series two to one from Texas Tech, winning on Saturday and Sunday after dropping Friday's game. Um, Melissa, the bats weren't awesome, but they were better they, they were good yeah. they were good enough on on saturday and sunday uh the pitching and the defense was excellent i thought for the majority of the part this weekend um cole klecker getting the save on saturday looked great three strikeouts uh caveman parker coming in uh in a clutch you know getting the save on on sunday as well um very emotional moment for him after the game uh, after all he's been through it was really cool to see caveman uh, step up in that big moment, but it just it just feels like whatever happens with with baseball, you know, it's one step forward and then another step back, and I just don't know what's going to happen with this team if they can't start to string more good days together. Well, this is what happened after Houston, right? They swept mm-hmm. Houston. They went on the road, lost the EPA. Um, it, I think I've kind of changed my mind on this. This isn't necessarily, I mean, it is a flawed team, but this is a young team that is going through the beatdown of a collegiate season. And I don't want to use that as an excuse because there are absolutely, there needs to be accountability at the coaching staff. There needs to be accountability with the players for sure. I mean, no, nobody is absolved of uh, a season that started out ranked top five in the country and is looking like it could very well end outside of the postseason altogether, maybe not even qualifying for the big 12 tournament. Um, you said they have to find a way to string together wins and something has to change. They've messed with the lineup. Got, got loud there. Mess with the lineup. They've messed with the rotation. They've, they've really thrown everything at the wall to see what can stick and nothing has stuck so far. I've watched a lot of these games. I, I, I would say I probably watched about 75% of these innings, but you probably watched about 98% of these innings. Is is there something that you think can change, or is this just kind of we got to play out the string and hope for the best at this point? I mean, things can always change, right? That's the optimist in me, and that's just watching, watching baseball for as long as I have. Things can always change. I still believe that this is a more talented team than the level they're playing at consistently. Um, But I also think that it gets harder and harder to dig yourself out of a hole, not even just physically at the plate or on the mound, but mentally once you've gone through a season like this, when you get down three to nothing and we know that the bats are capable of putting up good good numbers because we saw it for the first month of the season. But you get down three nothing now after losing, you know, twelve of your last twenty games, 
And all of a sudden, it's not, hey, we're going to bounce back. We can do this. We've got the we've got the power to do this. It's here we go again. It, it, it you know early in the season they would make a mistake and come back from that mistake and respond. These days it's they make a mistake and then they compound that mistake into more mistakes. Tonight uh, being the perfect example to lead off walks in the first inning uh, issued by Braden Sloan. He gets a ground ball and you think, okay, so he, they gave up three runs, but hey, he gets he gets one hit on the ground and Carson Bowen can't handle it at first base. And instead of getting the first out, it's more runners on and another run in. You know, it's, it's just the, these mistakes are compounding now instead of getting erased. And that, that, I mean, that just, that builds and builds and builds until you can't, until you can't get out of the hole anymore. And we talked last episode about how there's still time. There's still runway. They took care of business this past weekend. Like they needed to against Texas tech. You're staring down the barrel of a road trip to Texas this weekend. You got three there. You come back and you host a DBU team. That's pretty damn good. Still ranked. And then you host a Kansas state team that's starting to find its footing as well. And so, you know, midweek games, notwithstanding, which the last two they've played, they haven't looked good in at all. You've got to be able to pull it together just enough on the weekends to come away with wins. They managed that this past weekend against a good Texas tech team, a very potent offensive lineup that they managed to keep mostly in check. Now you've got to string that together at least over the weekend uh, and, and figure out a way to do it against Texas. I think at this point in the season, you've got to find some more lineup stability. I think this is their 32nd lineup in 34 games this year. Uh, that's too many. I understand that they've had injuries. I understand that they've got young guys trying to figure out playing college ball. But the reality is, is that to an extent, baseball players are creatures of habit. And if they're showing up to the ballpark most days and they're not sure where they're hitting in the lineup or where they're playing in the field, it's hard to fully mentally lock in sometimes. And again, it's a hard, it's a, it's way easier to sit in this chair and talk about it than to actually put that lineup card together. But at some point, I think some consistency would do a couple of these bats some good. You know, we've seen Chase Brunson in the leadoff spot the last 12 or 13 games, and he's, he's played really well because he comes in every day and he knows I'm going to be the center fielder and I'm going to lead off. And I think that's, that's a byproduct of having that kind of consistency. I don't think everyone in the lineup has that level of consistency right now, though. Uh-oh, it looks like we lost Melissa to the bowels of Sacramento Kings Basketball Stadium. I don't know the name of it. Melissa, do you read me? Do you copy? I Yeah, I don't know what just happened there. But, it's all good. Um, yeah, Chase Brunson, leadoff spot. Um, I, I was, I was going to say, and I don't know where you left off, but TCU has four Big 12 baseball series remaining. They currently are sitting in 12th in the standings. Top 10, I believe, make the Big 12 tournament, correct? Yes. So you've got to probably win two of your last four series to be on the bubble to make the Big 12 tournament and really probably need to go three and one in those final four series in order to ensure that you're there. I think at this point, you, you have to reset the goal. The goal is to get to the Big 12 tournament. Because then it becomes, you know, just one game samples over and over again. And we've seen PCU be very, very successful in those scenarios. Um, not making the Big 12 tournament would be an abject failure at this point um, of a season. Like, I think that that mm -hmm. is the lowest bar we've seen for this program. Obviously, there are more teams. But um, finishing outside of the top 10 in the Big 12 in and in a pretty average year for the Big 12 or kind of a down year potentially um, would be not a disaster, but pretty close to it. Um, and I think you need to you need to keep playing baseball. Um, I'm not worried about making a regional. I'm certainly not worried about hosting a regional at this point. I want to see this team get to some type of, kind of like the Sacramento Kings, get to some type of postseason play and just let, let be able to play with that freedom and that energy every game and just let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, I, I hear that. And I agree. Uh, I think I would say that it would be an abject failure to miss the Big 12 tournament. You know, not only yeah, is it an yeah. average year, for for, sure. for the conference, but you were picked number one. You were the favorite to win it. 
you were a top five seed coming into your top five team coming into this year. Um, and yes, a little bit of that has to do with carryover resume from a season ago. But the reality is, is that it also had a lot to do with identifying uh, people across the country looking at this roster and saying, yeah, they've got a crap ton of talent on this team. And, you know, it, they got to figure it out one way or another. Uh, it is now eight to three in the top of the eighth. So, you know, six more outs for them to maybe string, string some runs together. But everything is pointing at TCU being 22 and 13 after this game tonight. And uh, they will have only scored eight or more runs in one of their last 18 games. So, you know, they've got to, they, they got to find something that, that generates more production at the plate or you can pitch as good as Peyton Tolle did on Friday night against Oklahoma state. And you're still going to be sweating out one, one to nothing wins at best. So um, obviously it's been a disappointing year to this point. There's still some time to turn it around, but it's got to happen now, or I'm not sure it's, it's going to happen at this point. Yeah. The, the, we've talked about the runway the whole time. The runway is coming to the end. Um, you know what else is coming to the end? My time to be able to do this without the background noise being inevitably terrible. Uh, the place Absolutely. Is something at Golden One Center. Uh, Kings Warriors on deck. If you want to, uh, I, I guess by the time you guys hear this, we'll know the result. I'm either going to be really, really sad or just happy to get one more game uh, by the time you hear this podcast. But please don't make fun of me if the Kings lose. I can't take it. I'm very, I'm very soft and very weak. So I, I will not send you any Steph Curry shouting at the Sacktown fans. You You're not built for this gif. You if will. You will send loses tonight. Yeah. If they win tonight, okay. I'll send it to you. If they win, okay, I'll send perfect. you that gif. Okay. If they lose, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave you alone. Um, you won't. But yes, it's this... not true. You guys will you will rip me to shreds in the group chat. I'm That's fine. That's shreds. what friends are for. I am not going to try and incite any kind of bad karma on the Dallas Mavericks. So fair. That's fair. You've already got enough of that with uh, Kyrie. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. So we're just we're over here just hanging by a thread. Really. Um, this has been the Frogs Insider Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can find us again wherever you get your podcasts, at, either via the Republic of Football Network feed or the Frogs Insider feed. Uh, subscribe to both. Subscribe to the YouTube channel where you can go watch that interview that I did with Emmanuel Miller. Uh, it's about 25 minutes long. I thought it was a great conversation with him. Uh, going to miss him a lot next season when he's no longer playing for TCU basketball, but that's only because he's going to be doing bigger and better things somewhere professionally. Maybe in Sacramento. Whether- Maybe in Sacramento, maybe even in Dallas. Who knows? Um, excited to see what comes next for E-Man. Uh, thank you to Hell's Half Acre Stadium Goods. Thank you to Dave Campbell's Texas Football. Uh, we will talk to you next time. Uh, go Frogs. All God's people said, light the beam. Oh, my goodness. Okay, here we go. We're out.